Hey guys, it's Olivia Blake, and this is me not writing. So last week, I actually filmed that video when we were in like week three of a sleep regression, and now we're going on week five. So I apologize in advance if anything is not very like coherent. I wanted to say eloquent, but I don't think anything is ever eloquent. So I just hope that it's coherent. Please forgive me. I have all sorts of, you know, the the fun like stress related breakouts are coming back. I um, have had some darker moments, but everything is fine. Okay, so this is gonna be pretty short, I think. Um, I, I'm also getting to the point where because it's so hard to get anything done, I am just gonna have to like answer whatever is in my in inbox during these times whenever I have the time to film this. So basically, um, I'm gonna continue to be flaky as hell. I don't know, I'm so sorry, I'm trying my best. Okay, let's see, what do I wanna tell you before we start? Um, the discussion post for Salt Houses that has posted, I think before next week, yeah, before next week, the new book for October will post, which is going to be Affinity by Sarah Waters. I wish I were more prepared with a summary for you, but essentially it's like it falls under the umbrella of sapphic, like psychological um, thriller. I'm not quite horror. I don't know. It's I'm kind of on the, I'm, I'm, it's unclear, but I have read that Sarah Waters, I've read Sarah Waters before, and I've read her being referred to as lesbian Charles Dickens, which I feel like felt right. She has a good way, you know, she writes in the historical period and she has a really good way of kind of highlighting the gender politics of the time while also writing like, her stuff is like very hot. So you're welcome. I will also, if you're the kind of person who like cares what I'm up to, then you will probably hear from me a couple of times this week. Um, yeah, I'm anticipating having some having some news for you about the Atlas series tomorrow. So that will be appearing in my social media and I will probably also just send out my monthly newsletter early because it's coinciding so closely with the beginning of the month. Um, so you can expect that from me if you like to hear news from me. Mm -hmm. Okay, so jumping in, we have book questions, like 100% book questions, which is fun. First, hi all of you, I know you read Regency Romance and I was wondering if you know any books where the leads are in an arranged marriage but fall in love eventually. So I don't know, if it, I can't recommend any specific books that fall under that trope. I think just to me, I, I sort of associate forced marriage, like including the fan fiction trope with like an older like generation of tropes, not super old, but you know, like just recently in the rear view. I think you, because it, A, it's usually straight and B, can have sort of like consent implications. It has like a ring of early 2000s to it. To me, if I were looking for that, I think I would look in the direction of like Julia Quinn, maybe Georgette Heyer. I think I think Tessa Dare has some, um, and I really like Tessa Dare. I love Tessa Dare, uh, just as a person and an author. Um, and you know, and it doesn't have to be problematic. I'm not saying that like all arranged marriage or forced marriage tropes are problematic. I'm just saying that they have a tendency to be because that like that's why they feel like older to me. That feels like something that people are more frequently trying to subvert. But I do think that people are subverting it very well in fantasy and science fiction. So if you're interested in that, I would recommend uh, Winter's Orbit by Everina Maxwell, which also happens to be queer and Empire of Sand by Tasha Suri, which I am sort of have just started reading, but I know that that is the trope. For me personally, I lean more towards like, I, I love the, the blue stocking paired up with the like rogue who secretly has a heart of gold or like, you know, there's a con artist involved. I love that. I really, really love, I will absolutely pick up any romance novel that features an experienced woman, like a widow or something, with like a very straight laced, like by the rules type man. Like I just get such a kick out of that. So that's like more my jam. Um, but I, but I have, like I said, have seen arranged marriage done well in science fiction and fantasy, where it, like you know it's built into the world building, where it makes a little bit more sense to me. Luckily, there are a lot of people who do read a lot of Regency romance who would have lists like this. I'm pretty sure if you search arranged marriage, you would get a list of titles of like people's best of 
lists for this kind of thing. I also always recommend going to the Ripped Bodice. I think they have lists and stuff, but you can also contact uh, the booksellers. So that's, it's actually my local bookstore, but it's an all romance bookstore. And so you can always ask them, what are your favorites that fall under this category? And they will be glad to help you. They're all super knowledgeable about romance novels. It's fantastic to go in there. Second question. Do you have any books similar to Alone With You in the Ether? Uh, I'm assuming, so Alone With You in the Ether is my book. I'm assuming you're asking for books that are like Alone With You in the Ether that are not by me, which is good because I don't have any other books like that one. So romance that's a bit deeper than rom-coms, no shade to them. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. So. I, Alone with You in the Ether is not a romance novel because romance with a with a you know romance the genre with a capital R has like rules that you you can't break you know it's kind of like you know so if you're a fan fiction reader fan fiction is such a safe space because um, you kind of know what you're getting into with tropes and you know when you enter something like that unless there's some you, unless it's marked like major character death or whatever you know you're getting into essentially a happy ending that's what that's what makes it feel like comfortable and safe so the romance genre is you know you're getting a happy ending and you know you're going to encounter you know some sort of third act conflict you know it's going to have some variation on a series of predictable tropes you know you'll get some subversions here and there but pretty much people are in it for the same kinds of things they want to see fake dating they want to see arranged marriage they want to see um the grumpy one and the sunshine one so yeah so alone with you in the ether is not that i would i would classify alone with you in the ether as literary romance but not a romance novel so it's about a romantic relationship but it is technically it technically falls under the the umbrella of literary literary technically means like you know it's more about the writing and more about what it what the book is saying about the world and about life and ideally sort of like an elevated prose i don't want to say like oh yes my my prose it's so elevated but you know there's a difference between me writing alone with you in the ether and me writing my my mechanical romance which is a rom-com very different in tone style etc so when i initially pitched alone with you in the ether because it is one that i tried to query first before uh, that people weren't people weren't interested in it which is fine but so i originally pitched it as call me by your name for mental illness uh by which i meant you know call me by your name by andre asaman it does have some problems people have taken issue with it because there's sort of like a power age imbalance but it does for queer romance what i felt alone with you in the ether was doing for mental illness where it was you know beautifying it essentially and just something that was very very intimate and very raw um, I would also since then say that it's a little bit similar to Normal People by Sally Rooney or just Sally Rooney stuff in general, which is also literary romance. Oh, I should add, if you've never read Alone With You in the Ether, it does have a happy ending, but it's just like not, it's not structured the way a romance novel would be structured. So that's why I don't consider it and would not tell people it's a romance novel because people Romance is a safe place. You want to know what you're getting into. And um, you kind of don't know what you're getting into when you're in a story about two people who are really, really grappling with what it means to be well or to be ill. So you want to look into literary books that center romance as the plot. Um, I have made a list for you, some of which I have read and some of which I haven't, but that will be probably easiest for you to just check out is in my actual answer to your post. But some suggestions I would have are Luster by Raven Leilani. Um, again, these don't all have happy endings, so just bear that in mind. Um, so Luster by Raven Leilani. The Age of Innocence by Edith Wharton is kind of like, I feel like Edith Wharton, you have an Edith Wharton phase after you have a Jane Austen phase uh, because it gives you like similar vibes. You've got Gilded Age New York, but um, people are a lot less happy. But that one's good. The Time Traveler's Wife by Audrey Niffenegger is great. I really like her. Um, I haven't read all of Isabella Allende's like catalog of books, but I think she does romance really well um, in, in like a deeper way. One Day by Na David Nichols, I will warn you, is a very, very sad book, but excellent. Exciting Times by Nisha Dolan is queer and fun. Basically Sally Rooney, but like slightly queerer. 
by the way, with Sally Rooney, I haven't read her most recent book, which I which I hear does have a happy ending. But anyway, um, I prefer personally normal people to conversations with friends. It just has to do with the protagonist. And then a book that I keep seeing is Norwegian Wood by Haruki Murakami. I haven't read it, but that's something that people say to try. So yeah, hopefully you find something in there. Okay, um, last question that we're going to cover. Someone asked me um, essentially things not to do for people who want to self-publish, which is an interesting uh, an interesting way to phrase that. It's, it's hard to say what not to do um, because I think it really depends what your goals are with self-publishing. This is, people often ask me, why did I choose to self-publish? And I mean, I think now it's becoming clear that the answer is I didn't choose to base my career on self-publishing. I just self-published some books and tried to traditionally uh, traditionally publish other books. And um, the one thing I can say is that I did intentionally choose to self-publish The Atlas Six, which is the book that most people, if they know about me, they know about The Atlas Six. And why did I choose to self-publish that? Um, it, you know, I think because I didn't want to when you're going to tra traditionally publish something, you are basically, you're giving up decision making um, and you do have to make yourself sort of palatable to publishing gatekeepers. Uh, a lot of which happen to be, they happen to be white, they happen to be more male dominated, etc. cetera. Um, so like one of the reasons that Alone With You and the Ether did not query well is because people would say things like, oh, I already have a mental illness book. I can't like go out with multiple mental illness titles. Uh, so it's, it's even, you know, it's, so it's like this, the hook was like almost more important than the book. Fine. And, you know, I had reached a point where it was like, okay, um, I've got this story that I want to tell. I want to write something that happens to be dark academia. I don't know how like original it is. I don't know if but like, I don't know how to pitch it to make it seem like it's not derivative, you know, because it, it, it is very similar to a lot of things. People will say it's like, oh, it's, it's like Susanna Clark, but with kissing, or it's like The Secret History by Donna Tartt, but with magic. Um, it's like The Umbrella Academy, which I've never seen, but now I like, I feel like I need to. Like X-Men, or I said it was a little bit like Kingsman. So, you know, this sense that people have that it's familiar is part of the reason why I didn't even try to traditionally publish it. Which doesn't answer your question, but uh, in terms of things not to do, um, I mean, first of all, you don't want to be like confused about what your goals are, I guess, in self-publishing. You have to be, if you want, mm -mm, if you want to make self-publishing the basis of your writing career, as in you want to make an income off of self-publishing, then obviously there are some rules you have to follow because you you have to be the kind of person who is willing to make yourself your business, um, which is not something that I was trying to do. I you know I started out in fan fiction. I had an audience, so I knew that if I published some books, there would be some people who would read them. And you know, prior to this year, we would be looking, I would sell, I don't know, maybe a thousand books total in a year. So, you know, we were talking like like a small, 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 smallish amount of, in terms, in terms of publishing as a way to make a living, a small amount of people, because that is, that was like barely gonna cover the groceries, right? So I guess, you know, rule number one, don't expect to make a lot of money off of a off your first book and b off of one book because i think people who do succeed in self-publishing they understand that you have to have um you know there has to be like a pipeline you have to continually produce books that's how you make money is when someone finds one book they like they continue buying your stuff and then it's it just becomes like sort of a you know a factory assembly line of stuff that is how you can eventually um accumulate an income. I know that this works very well for genres like science fiction and fantasy and for um, romance, definitely, definitely for romance, uh, for erotica. It will not work for young adult or children's because, you know, th those books go through the adult gatekeepers. You don't really have teenagers that are, are necessarily trying to buy self-published books. They are buying books that like they see at Barnes and Noble. 
Um, similarly, I don't know that you would be able to self-publish like historical fiction, especially because that's the kind of thing that's so research dependent that like you would want to have an advance. So I guess one thing is, so don't try to self-publish in a genre that is unlikely to be successful via self-publishing. But there are like ravenous uh, science fiction, um, mystery, thriller, uh, romance readers who will pick up self-published books if they're priced at a, you know, at a certain like very accessible price point and you're really just aiming for volume, not like a lot of royalties off of one title, if that makes sense. And you know, you definitely don't want to self-publish before you're ready. Uh, you want to have editors. I'm not gonna, like, I don't want to, I never had the resources to pay for a professional editor. So I worked with critique partners and edited my own stuff. I think that if you can have a professional editor, that's great and you should. Um, but I also think that if you wanna make money off self-publishing, you are going to have a higher return on your investment on graphic design. You need to have you know, a good cover, good like formatting and all that stuff. That would be my thing is if you, if you don't have a lot of resources to put into it, you have to have excellent friends, great friends who are willing to read a lot of your books, which I had, um, and a very rigorous self-editing process. Um, and either you have to be a competent designer or you need to pay for good design. Uh, I think generally, you know, people ask me, people ask me about like self-publishing and traditionally publishing, traditional publishing in general, this is the kind of question I answer and re-answer all the time. And I think it just comes down to it's, you're making a decision about access and decision-making. So with self-publishing, you get all the decision making with very limited access. You are providing everything. So everything with the Atlas Six and, and all my other self-published books, I used Amazon's Kindle Direct publishing um, platform, which to me I think is the easiest one, um, but it's also a little bit limited. So um, because I didn't want my books to be so expensive, I used to publish them purely through Amazon. Uh, if you choose to expand distribution, which puts it on like the Ingram distribution list and provides to like schools and libraries and uh, Barnes and Noble uh, book depository, you you have to raise your prices pretty like fair, pretty substantially to cover the like margin of profit for the additional booksellers. So if you want your book to be able, not that it will definitely be carried in stores, um, but if you want it to be able to be carried in stores by independent booksellers or Barnes & Noble, then you have to choose the expanded distribution option, which means you have to have more expensive books, which means you know, you're less likely to have people who are just gonna pick it up because it's like within a certain price range. Um, but you know, that's not a what not to do or anything. Um, but yeah, you know, if people do really end up liking your book, then that means it's on you to provide the audiobook, to provide translations, to provide hardcovers, all the stuff that people ask me about all the time, which is very, 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 very hard to produce on my own. Um, so that's just something to consider. Uh, I also don't really consider myself a business person. Like sales is not my strong suit, neither is publicity. Um, I was just putting out books because what I wanted to do was write books and I had books and I put them out there and kind of let the universe do what it wanted. I There was never any guarantee that what I wanted to write was gonna be what other people wanted to read. I happened to get very lucky. And then I also would not, like I said, you don't want to, you can't just rely on the assumption that your first book or your only book is going to do well because the Atlas Six didn't randomly take off until I, over a year after it was published. So it's just something you have to have some patience. You really have to have a pipeline. You have to have some sort of innate understanding of what comes next because the process of focusing on the one self-published book that you've put out is, is it's going to take a while, I think. Um, to see where that takes you. With writing in general, I talk about this all the time. I'm very privileged because I have my husband. I have another income. Um, it's he's He supports me, he gives me the time and the space to write. Uh, that's not something that everybody has. And so, you know, why am I able to produce the amount that I'm able to produce? Because my husband has never said, hey, go get a real job. So yeah, I do have to acknowledge that as, as having, you know, someone, having financial and emotional support otherwise i would not have been able to write essentially for free for like five years with with truly no no real income 
So yeah, that's just something to keep in mind. But anyway, um, I'm going to cut this off now. I got to go. Hopefully my child is sleeping, but if he's not, then that's what I'll be doing next. If you are signed up for my newsletter, which gets sent once a month, promise that will arrive in your inbox probably tomorrow. Um, I'm ex really excited to have some more news for you because it's been a while since I've been able to say anything except like <laughs> wink wink. Yeah, I'm really hoping to sleep, but um, we'll see. Any mothers out there want to feel a little bit more understood, I suggest Little Labors by Rivka Galchin. I just read that and I feel better. I read it at like three in the morning, so I feel as good as one can being awake and, and reading that at three in the morning. This has been me, Olive Blake, not writing, and I'll see you next week.